Good evening everyone. Hi, this is Charlotte from Enriching Environments and welcome to this evening's Top Tip Tuesday about developing concentration in the young child. So, before we begin, I wanted to talk through the post that we spoke about um, the other day about developing concentration and there was a few snippets of video from um, the first one was Olivia at a couple of weeks old and then we went to Harry kicking a ball with his feet when he was about I believe it was six seven months old and then Harry later as a three-year-old um, doing some puzzle uh, some shape puzzles over and over again and those were the examples of concentration that I used in the video so um, concentration developing in the young child it's really incredible and you were and it's something that isn't believable until you actually observe it is that um sorry if i'm distracted we've got a little a stray kitten who's come to live with us and um she's really really playful so she's sort of pouncing on me and biting my hand out of shot when uh, when i'm speaking um so concentration in is possible for uh, as much as up to 30 minutes in even a very young baby and this is incredible because we are um, sort of marketed and sold this idea that babies are not able to focus that young children are not able to focus but really they are they are more than capable of focusing for long periods of time it is just that they need the right environment, the right opportunities to be able to concentrate. And that's what's really, really important, is providing them with opportunities to concentrate. And that means everything in your, env in your environment, the physical environment itself, it means the toys that you put in it, it means the energy, as I said in the post, the energy that we put into our interactions with our children. All of these are really, really important when it comes to concentration. So, um, Let's look at what do we put first for concentration. Okay, so the first, I think perhaps maybe the most important thing, or for me certainly, um, with my experience in the classroom and my experience with my own children, is to not interrupt a child when they are focusing, when they are concentrating. Do not interrupt them. So um, this is really hard for um, us as parents because we naturally want to go over and praise our child we naturally want to go over and I don't know ruffle their hair or um, be interested in what they're doing or say a compliment or um, say something loving to them or approach them and it's this is from our place of love and it's really tricky because it's natural for us as parents um, to want to do this however this breaks their concentration, even if it's, you know, praise, even if it's a compliment, even if it's affection, it is going to break their concentration. And that's what we want to avoid. Um, concentration is a skill that um, is accessible to all of us, but it must be honed and it must be developed over a period of time. And we can start early in early childhood, um, because as we know, everything is a lot easier if we learn it when we're really, really little. So it's our, what we can do for the first thing that we can do that's really important and really easy is just not to interrupt when our child is working or playing with something, whatever you call it, work or play, doesn't matter. When they are engaged in something, when a newborn is um, gazing at the shadows on the wall, you know, as um, I don't know, they can see the shadow of a tree on the wall or they're looking at the lights or, you know, you, newborns gaze at things for a long time and because their vision isn't perfect is only 30 centimeters in the first six weeks of life they they have this otherworldliness about them you can see sort of their spirit as it were and they're really um dreamy and far away in those first couple of weeks and months and so um they gaze at shadows a lot they gaze at different lights on the wall and things and so we don't interrupt them at this stage they're content they're happy they're they're fed and they're watching and they're observing and they're listening they're taking everything in around them with all of their senses so with your newborn don't interrupt them just sit and observe see what they're doing um, so that's what it looks like in the newborn moving to um, an older baby a sitting up baby for example who is exploring a basket um, of simple household items that you've put out for them 
um, don't interrupt again. They, the as parents, are really our instinct, isn't it, is to um, engage and to um, sit with them and play with them while they're while they're exploring. And the thing to do is to engage when they seek to engage. We're not abandoning them or leaving them on their own or anything of that. This is about respecting their space and knowing that every time we don't interrupt, every time that we allow them to play or explore or work for a little bit longer, this is extending their ability to concentrate, which is going to help them so much later with school. Like It's going to help them so much um, when they're studying for exam. It's going to help them so much as adults, um, particularly in our world, which is... Um, increasingly digitally based and there's um you know it makes me laugh when you see blog posts and it's such a sign of times isn't it and it says you know three minute read or eight minute read or 15 minute read because we're just jumping from thing to thing you know whether we're um swiping or we're using instagram facebook what have you every our attention spans are shortening and shortening and shortening so for us in this generation where technology is going to be a part of life you know when they're when they're growing up we don't know what it's going to look like exactly but um, most of their life, uh, as they get to older children and uh, adults, is going to be in front of a screen. So let's develop the concentration skills now so that when they're older, they actually have the capacity to do other things as well. Hi there, um, for everyone who's joined. Um, so that's, yeah, in babies, uh, when they're exploring uh, a treasure basket, as I say, don't, don't interrupt, don't go over even to praise or to engage with them. And then get moving to a piccolini, moving to a toddler. Um, what concentration looks like in a toddler is when they are doing things like household tasks. This is why for Piccolini, household tasks, we call them practical life in Montessori. Household tasks are so, so important because it gives them an opportunity to concentrate, to focus. It gives them an opportunity to, um, to repeat and re repetition um, builds neural pathways. And what we want to do is build strong neural pathways that will enable them to not only gain new skills, that's what they're doing as Piccolini's, they're gaining new skills every time they wash a window, every time they mop the floor, every time they use the dustpan and brush, of course they're gaining new skills, but their concentration that they are developing in that time, that's what's really, really important. And you'll notice with the Piccolini, you only need, a few, it's a handful of materials you need for to engage a Piccolini in household tasks. And they seem to become at one with this task and I know this sounds really strange unless you've experienced it with your piccolini but they do become and Harry's still in that stage my son he's three and a half but he's still in that zone that when he's hoovering or when he's mopping or when he's um, cleaning the easel he is just at one with that and his focus and his concentration is incredible and I have to try really hard yes even me who's meant to know what she's doing I try and find it really hard to not interrupt him to not offer praise, to not make a comment. And what I really try and do is just engage when he seeks to engage, wait for him or his sister, Olivia, to engage first before I say what I want to say. So I let him do the, the activity or the work or the play as many times as possible. The repetition, as I say, builds the neural pathways and it builds the concentration. And every time we um, interrupt, we break that concentration, so they've sort of got to start again. But conversely, every time we don't interrupt, we are strengthening those neural pathways. We are strengthening their ability to be able to um, concentrate for longer and longer periods of time. Um, and then for your preschooler, what concentration can look like in a preschooler? Most preschoolers, so age between three and six, absolutely love preparing food. So this is where you'll really, really see it in, in the preschooler. And also preschoolers love... Still like cleaning to some extent, but not as intensely as a piccolini. Um, you know, playing with wooden blocks, playing with um, Lego, pretend play, whether you've got teddies or dolls or whatever you have in your home. That um, requires a huge amount of concentration because it's becoming more complex. They've got a huge range of language skills in the three to six area. And they are um, making sense of their world through their play um, in a way that a piccoli does less. And, Piccolinis are more about practical life and, and performing those household tasks over and over again. Three to six, they are perfecting and they're repeating, but the um, symbolic play, the pretend play, the role play, the turn-taking, all of those come in in the three to six period. And so 
the pre template is huge in terms of the building concentration. And again, I know our instinct is to interrupt, is to, I don't know, ask what they're doing. It's to take a photo of them, all of those things that might distract them and break the concentration. But our urge is to, um, our urge should be to just observe or do nothing or do something else rather than break their concentration. Um, I was doing a, a workshop for some um, parent enrichment clients a couple of weeks ago and I said to them, whenever you feel the urge to pick up your phone to take a photo or a video, instead just observe what your child is doing because that's not going to break the concentration. Whereas as soon as they've got a camera or a phone pointed at them for a video or, or photo, it's quite likely that that's going to break the concentration. And they may be, um, you know, in, depending on how they react to the camera, that may interrupt them. Um, so they want to then perform for the camera, which obviously is going to be unnatural. Or it might just break the concentration and they don't continue with the work. So that's what concentration is going to look like. For your newborn, um, they're going to watch the shadows on the wall, they're going to watch the light on the wall, the leaves reflecting. For your sitting up baby, they're going to be exploring their little basket of toys. For your piccolini, they're going to be doing a lot of household tasks and this is where the repetition comes in and as I said, they really become at one with the task that they're doing. This is their building concentration. And as your preschooler, food preppers and pretend play are really good areas where you see them really, really focusing. Um, so that's my first um, invitation to you to foster concentration in your young child. And excuse me, I'll take a sip of water and we'll move on to number two. So number one was um, don't interrupt. Number two is also really, really simple and it's just allow time and space for um, concentration to develop. So what this looks like in real terms is it means not scheduling activities for your children to do all day, every day. Um, in Montessori, we would say no scheduled or um, adult-led activities under the age of six anyway. Um, but I do appreciate that um, structured activities and... Um, these types of classes and things are very popular here in Dubai um, and I guess all over the world but particularly in Dubai I notice how much people really um, like to engage with these very adult-led um, classes with their children so if you are going to do them it's keep them to an absolute absolute minimum um, children need time to develop concentration they're not going to develop concentration in a swimming class they're not going to develop concentration in by an adult telling them to develop it or telling them to behave in a certain way do you know what I mean they just need time and space so that's time your, your preschooler that's time for free play that's time for them to play with the blocks or play with their lego or um, come and do some food prep in the kitchen with their caregiver um, for playing with their teddies with their dolls whatever it is um, and for your baby, it's allowing them that time to watch the shadows, allowing that time to explore the treasure basket, Piccolini, allowing that time for them to wash the windows and mop the floor and all of those things. It's just time and space. Um, and it's really on turned upside down for what society expects us to be doing with our children. But honestly, less is more. Um, I read a brilliant quote about all we should do in the early years is potter, potter around the house and do everyday things with our children. Um, but the problem is, is that that's contrary to what society expects of us and it, what society ex tells us that we should be doing in the early years. And also, um, it's really hard being a stay-at-home parent. And sometimes it's it, you maybe have these full busy days and really exhausting, but it's, it's, it's quite repetitive. And it can be really lonely as well, particularly in a culture like, um, in a society like Dubai, where maybe we're being stay-at-home uh, parents for extended periods of time because of the whole working situation here. Um, and it can be really, really lonely. So it's finding a balance. Give your children as much time and space as you can, but also you've got to look after yourself. And if you do need to go out and do activities and groups to meet people, then definitely do that. And you can perhaps... Form your own group of playdates with like-minded parents who um, 
understand the value of concentration as well and know that your your children don't or their children as well don't need to be entertained the whole time can you find a network of parents of like-minded families to have play dates with who are not going to be interrupting the children the whole time um, and that's actually what I'm building with the enriching environments community you can go on to um, my website enrichingenvironments.com and click on join our family and there you can um, enter your child's uh, ages and your location and then you can um, from that you'll be able to find other like-minded people in your area people who are also interested in this type of parenting approach so you're going to be more likely to find somebody in a community like this who's going to have the similar value similar values to you as you but no matter where you find your your extended family your tribe wherever you are in the world it's um, really important to find people who also see the same value in free play, the same value in practical life, the same value in the things that are important to you as well. Um, so that's number two, time and space with your child. Um, and then moving on to number three, um, the choice of our toys for our children is really, really important. Um, toys that foster concentration are ones that are open-ended, that give opportunities for free play. And also it's worth looking at the materials in your, of your toys as well. So um, starting very, very early with little, little children, with babies, um, plastic is not a satisfying material. Sorry, I'll take a step back. Children um, engage with their world with all five of their senses for the first six to seven years of their life. So they're learning through all of their senses. So we need to give them rich sensorial experiences. And that is inclu that includes the toys that they play with. And what that looks like, and the things that they're exploring, what that looks like is natural materials. So wooden blocks um, and um, open-ended toys, as I said, wooden blocks, um, wooden shapes, a wooden spoon that has smells and flavors of it from your kitchen for a baby, for example. All of these materials, you, they don't need to be expensive. I appreciate that wooden toys are more expensive than plastic toys, but the great thing about wooden toys is that you only need to buy one of them. You only need to buy one set of wooden blocks. Um, and here, if you're here in Dubai, there is a really fantastic um, network of where you can buy pre-loved toys um, and lots of wooden toys as well. So uh, there's on the Facebook groups, on Dubizzle, um, so you don't need to spend uh, a fortune. I know that um, plastic is very alluring and appealing and it's designed in that way. You know, these people, uh, um, these toy companies and any company who's uh, marketed, well, who markets anything, but particularly in children, these, these people who, who are selling us stuff have got PhDs in psychology and they know what buttons they need to press to get us to buy their stuff and they know what is appealing to children and they know that um, uh, what is appealing to us as adults what pushes our buttons that we think will be the best educational toys or what have you for our children but what I want to tell you is that natural materials best simple natural materials if you don't have any toys or can't afford any toys don't worry you don't need them you've got enough from the natural world um, you have shells from the beach, you've got pine cones from the forest, you have wooden spoons from your kitchen, you have enough, you'll have enough wooden materials, um, uh, natural materials in your home to give them a rich sensorial experience. Um, going out on the grass, feeling sand between their fingers, all of these things are rich experiences that offer um, for real first-hand experiences, which is so vital in early childhood, more than all the plastic toys in the world. Um, the only thing you need to do if taking anything from the natural world is just use a little bit of sanding paper to smooth it all down. So any shells from the beach, um, I just sand down there if there's any sharp edges. If Obviously I try and get ones that are smooth, but if I get home and found that they, they need some smoothing, I just a little bit of sandpaper. Um, again, pine cones, um, they can just be smoothed down. So those type of things can be really, really inexpensive. But if you want to go and get a really beautiful um, wooden toy or family members want to buy something that's really special that's going to last your childhood throughout early childhood, something like the Grimm's toys, um, Grimm's, G-R-I-M-M-S, um, they're a German company and they produce the most beautiful wooden toys. 
Um, we have the four elements puzzle, which is um, a mix of lots of different uh, colours and shapes of puzzles, which is amazing for building blocks. Olivia was given to it by her father's parents. Um, when was it? When she was two and she's almost six and her and Harry still play with it every single day. Um, it is absolutely a fantastic, imaginative toy. Um, has endless uses. Um, the amount of times that every day, you know, a different piece is used as a phone, for example, um, or, uh, or a lolly. I mean, Harry really needs to bite things to get, and get a release in his jaw. So he loves biting things because they're wooden. It's very, very satisfying for him. He's not going to damage his teeth. Um, and they just, they, you know, they smell beautiful. They've got a beautiful grain on them. The paint is non-toxic, so they can put them in their mouths, um, all of these things. So if you have the resources to get one really, really good toy, then I'd recommend doing that. But if not, then you can get them secondhand on loads of Facebook groups and online, um, or take things from nature that are just uh, safe and smooth and what have you. Um, so the choice of toys is really important. Plastic doesn't provide any sensory feedback. And also with plastic is that generally they are, um, with the exception of something like Lego, which is free play and creativity, plastic toys are usually designed um, or can only have one purpose, which means that when your child loses interest in it and they it can't, it's not either in their range of development or it's not interesting for them anymore, then you're going to need to buy something else. And obviously it's designed like that, so it's designed for you to buy more and more and more stuff. However, with um, an open-ended wooden toy, you've got the sensorial experience, um, it provides sensory feedback for them, and it's going to last you for a longer time, so you're not going to need to buy something new every three months, or you're not going to need to um, replace it the whole time. And obviously wooden things are going to be more durable than plastic as well. Plastic things will break, and then... You know, anything with a battery and it needs to be replaced and then you lose the back of the battery compartment and you know or maybe that's just me um we've got a bubble machine it's just such a nightmare because we're always losing parts of it it's just it absolutely kills me the children love it but it just kills me um uh, so that's the thing think about the materials of the toys that you are um getting for your children that's really important um number four for fostering concentration so um this one is a really, a really, really big one, and depending where you are in the world and what your climate's like, um, this is going to look different to different people. But I cannot overemphasize the importance of time in nature for children. Um, nature is an invitation for all of us to slow down, to concentrate, to um, to notice, to observe, and so when we're in nature. Uh, our children will notice insects. They're closer to the ground. You know, go for a walk with a toddler and, and a walk that takes you five minutes will take them half an hour. And that's the beauty of it. That's the, that's the joy of early childhood. That's the joy that they have a joy and a wonder in everything that they see and, and magic in everything that they see in the natural world. And um, they're inviting us to be part of it. They're inviting you to be part of it. And if we can foster this love of nature, then na the nature and, and joyfulness and concentration, they all go, they're all um, entwined, they're all part of the same um, puzzle piece, actually, for enrichment in, in early childhood, enrichment of our children's lives. Um, you know, watching ants, for example, a beetle crawling across the grass or across a path, that, you know, invites us to slow down, that invites concentration. And if we're able to, um, again, step back and not interrupt, not say too much, let our child have their own experience when they're in nature and watching nature, that is a beautiful gift that we can give them. That promotes the concentration and shows also that we're interested in what they're interested in. Um, so time in nature, I can't emphasize enough. Um, natural experiences, um, time in nature, uh, unscheduled, um, child-led, uh, and, and free play or free exploration you don't need to be doing anything else yeah it's lovely to sometimes go out and kick a ball um, but also it's lovely to run around on the grass until you're so tired you flop and then you get to notice the beetles and the insects and the, and the ants you know carrying something from one place to another all of those things are um, you're just lying on your back in uh, in the grass and watching watching the clouds. You know things like that are uh, 
are just so magical and so easy to do to promote to promote concentration. So nature really is a gift for us in terms of promoting concentration and allowing our children and ourselves to to slow down enough so that we have time to concentrate, we have time to lie on the grass and notice the cloud moving very, very slowly across the sky, or notice the ants as they're going forward and back, or noticing the um, the wind in the trees or the grasses or whatever it might be. So nature is really a beautiful, beautiful gift, so I can't emphasise that, um, that enough. And being in nature with our child, actually, with our children, really can tell us what they're interested in, where their interests lie. And this is actually my leading into my to my fifth point in terms of fostering concentration is we all concentrate more or are interested more when we are following our own interests and the children are the same as adults. We can read a book about something we're interested in probably all day if we had the time, but as we're parents, we don't have the time, so we only get five minutes to read a book, if at all. Um, but following our children's interests is such an easy way to um, foster their concentration. As soon as we are out and about or in the natural world and we notice they're interested in something, then that informs us on how we can support them better. They are really interested in ants, so we can research some poems about ants on Google. We can go to the library and, and um, borrow some books on on insects, we can learn more ourselves about it by looking online so that we have some information to pass on to our children when next time we get to see an ant's nest or whatever it might be. So following their interests really um, supports us so much in in supporting them actually. And if you're able to get a really good um, encyclopedia, and I mentioned this before in Instagram Live, but I'm always banging on about it. There's this amazing encyclopedia of Arabia um, which Prolific Taco told me about, it gave me the original recommendation. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and it tells you all about the flora and fauna of um, Arabia, of here we, where we are on the, um, on the Arabian Peninsula. It's got information about flora and fauna, it's got um, cultural information, religion, dress, food, all of that. It's absolutely brilliant. And particularly for the natural world, it tells us all of the insects, all the birds, all the animals that we'll see every day here in Dubai and um, what to look out for and learn about their habitats. And this is, has been such a brilliant book for, uh, for Olivia and Harry for expanding their knowledge and what they're interested in, what they see on a day-to-day basis. Um, and of course, their toddlers and young children are interested in a lot of things, but if we can as much as possible um, follow the interests of what they see on a daily basis, this is even more powerful. Um, obviously, it's really important to look at the broader world as well, but what they can see on a daily basis and expand their, their knowledge and expand their love of something on a daily basis, that is really, really valuable to them. So, um, uh, hi Kate, what was the book called? It's called The Encyclopedia of um, Arabia, what I will do is I'll put it on my stories, Kate. Um, it's not actually here at the moment, it's elsewhere, so otherwise I'd just show you. But it's Encyclopedia of Arabia. Caroline, are you there? Uh, the um, author is um, Mary, I can't remember what her name is, but if Caroline's on, she has, the, uh, she has the same book. She recommended it to me so she can tell me the author. But Encyclopedia of Arabia, I got it on Book Depository. Dot, um, com, book depository book dot com and it came from the UK but didn't take long only a couple of weeks to come um, uh, where were we so we have said that time in nature we've talked about observing interests oh yes the next thing I wanted to talk about and it sort of ties in with what we were saying about Piccolini's in practical life ah Kate, Caroline has just said, Mary Beardwood is the author of the Encyclopedia of Arabia. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, the, uh, for Piccolini, I gave the example that practical life is really, really important for them for developing concentration, repetition and um, mastering a skill. And the way we can support, what the way this is important is it ties in with um, Mary Beardwood. I think it is, Caroline said. Um, the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Arabia. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, 
so one of the um, one of the ways we can really support concentration is by supporting our children in problem solving so that they have the um, confidence to overcome obstacles and of course in order to overcome obstacles we need to have the skills and the confidence to be able to do that so what I mean is when a child is finding something difficult we don't like buttoning like putting their shoes on or buttoning their shirt or whatever it might be um, we don't do it for them we support them in overcoming the obstacle and that might be that might look like a couple of things but um, for Harry for example if he's struggling with um, I can't think of an example of he's struggling with say he's struggling with his buttons just me getting close to him and sitting near him for support seems to help him. I don't say anything unless I feel that he needs me to say something or to offer any help. Just me getting a little bit closer and my presence seems to help him to try again and try again. Because when they're problem solving for themselves, when they're overcoming obstacles for themselves, of course, if they're buttoning their shirt, for example, putting their shoe on, they're naturally developing their concentration because they need to have that concentration to try again and try again and try again until they succeed, until they complete their task. Um, so you can do, yeah, the first thing is just to sit closer to them. Just your presence sometimes can help them. And then if you feel they need a little bit more, you sort of, it's sort of like coaching them through it. So um, you talk through... If they're putting their t-shirt on and and, uh, and they're getting stuck, you can say, oh, it's just that armhole to get in there and stretch your arm up, stretch your arm up really, really far, and I'm sure you'll be able to get your fingers through. Something like that. Or putting the shoes on. If you just pop your thumb in here and pull gently, then that might help. Something like that. And obviously, you're, the last thing you do is offer just that little bit of help for them to complete. But it's the, the main um, focus the main element is for us not to take over, us to help them with the problem solving skills and indirectly that helps with the concentration because they get into that, that um, mindset that they do, um, will come will come to obstacles but you, they are able to overcome those obstacles. Um, so supporting them in problem solving is another big part of concentration. I think that was number six. Um, and number seven, that I want to say is it sort of circles back to what we first of all said at the beginning of the session was about um, the environment, the environment that we have. Everyone's home looks different, um, of course, and some of us may have bold colours and bold prints and um, I've got two very bold armchairs and a big bold Persian rug, um, but the, the space itself, um, is there lots going on? You know, turn off the radio in the background, turn off the screens of the TV in the background. Um, uh, thank you, Nuna, for your comment. What would you do if the kid feels frustrated and refuses to try again and ask you to do it for them? Um, I think, Nuna, it depends on the age. Can you remind me of the age? Is she 21 months, your daughter? Um, it depends really what, what it is. It's the, our main objective is to offer them minimum amount of help for them to be able to succeed. You could acknowledge the, the frustration. The first thing you could do, you could say, you feel really frustrated, don't you? It's a real, um, and I try to use sort of light language. Oh, that's such a bother, isn't it? Oh, that's really tricky. Or I just can't, you just can't, I just can't get the hang of that. It is really a bother, isn't it? Something like that, something to kind of lighten it but to acknowledge the frustration at the same time. So, oh, you feel, yeah, two years. So you feel really frustrated, don't you? Um, let me see what I can do to support. What can I do to help you? What can I do to support you? Sort of open, open questions to invite conversation, invite collaboration, show that you're there for support, but you're not taking over. There will be some times, for sure, that we will need to take over and they're not going to be able to do it for us. If they've got to a point of frustration where nothing else is going to work and they're upset, of course we're going to need to step in and take over. But it's offering on each occasion, and this is a learning process, um, the, min the smallest amount of help, the minimum amount of help that they need in order to succeed in that moment. A little bit of coaching might help. 
a little bit, if they're putting a t-shirt on, they get stuck. You're like, oh no, quickly, round the back, round the front, round the back, round the front. Oh no, it's caught in your ear. You know, bring in a little bit of humor, a bit of gentle humor if you can. That works really well with Piccolini um, uh, humor. Um, and talking about humor, if, for example, you, as you say, your situation refuses to try again and asks you to do it for them, if it's something like getting dressed, I would always do something really silly like, um, try and put the t-shirt on myself or try and put the shoe on my foot or you know put the undies on my head or whatever try and do something um, playful to just sort of lessen that frustration lessen that intensity because of course Piccolini you know their brains aren't developed uh, sufficiently yet to have the concentration to have the patience to try again and try again however we can diffuse this intensity with a little bit of humor a little bit of playfulness a little bit of being silly um, and invariably they'll try again. You put, you know, you try and put the t-shirt on uh, yourself or your child's trousers or the shoe on, guaranteed they're going to try and do it again because um, they, 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 naturally want, they naturally want to do it and they naturally want to um, perfect their skills, but they just might need a little bit of emotional support on the way and playfulness is a really good way of, um, uh, of doing that. And again, acknowledge it. Once you've said, oh, yeah, you're frustrated, you could, and she demands, oh, you know, I want you to do it. So, yeah, you really want me to help, don't you? I'm here to help you. What can I do to help? What can I do to support you? And then just t talking through it. If it's the T-shirt, let's do this arm. Let's do that arm. Stretch out really, really high. Let's wiggle your fingers. Um, you know, things like that. It's a little bit of coaching so that um, we can lessen the frustration a little bit but still allow them to complete and have that sense of um, that sense of self and that sense of self-direction that they will only get from completing it for themselves. And then around the age of you know two and a half, three, they'll start saying, "Me did it, me did it for myself." Um, and it's so gorgeous when they start doing that as well, actually. Um, so what was I going to say? Point seven. Yes, the environment. So it's a calm space. That doesn't mean that you need to have um, you know somber lighting and somber you know paints and, and a perfect clean and tidy environment that's not at all what I mean what I mean is a calm space that um, honors their need to concentrate so we can turn off the background the background noise a TV in the background or the radio in the background so that they can concentrate it means having a little a little whether it's a corner or a shelf or whatever your space allows a dedicated area for them with the things that are ordered pleasure with the things that are ordered just for them you know I'm in my uh, parent enrichment courses and actually a lot on these Instagram lives you talk about really really paring it down for a little baby or a piccolini only three toys on the shelf um, something's really really simple something very simple and ordered and accessible for them this is going to support their concentration because they see this is their space this is their order External order in the environment builds to internal order inside them. Again, this is another one of the building blocks of concentration. So your environment's going to be calm. It's got to be ordered. Um, and whilst we're here, let's talk about screens. Um, screens is a really divisive topic. Um, and people have different situations and different reasons for using screens. And it may be a necessity in some families and others. However, what I want to say to you is all of your amazing work that you're doing in fostering concentration in other areas um, by time and nature and the toys you're providing, this is going to be undone by the use of screens because screens are addictive. They make our children passive. Because of the fast-moving images and the way the screen is composed, it, um, it makes them change their concentration, change their focus over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for the duration that they're doing it. So naturally they lose concentration. And um, although our children may be passive and may be quiet when they are watching a screen, that doesn't mean that they're concentrating. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing for our children to be quiet and our children to be passive. However much we want that break and we may need that time for whatever reason, so screens are not a way to foster concentration. If we are able to avoid screens in the early years, that is brilliant. That is our, our ultimate aim. Um, but 
of course, in today's world, they're going to see a lot of screens around them anyway when they go to the mall, when they go to the supermarket. I mean, they're everywhere, aren't they? On the metro, on the bus, they're everywhere. Um, but if we are able to create an environment which is screen-free as much as possible, then we are setting our children on a much more positive footing for the future. And this is the this is really the seemingly the contradiction. And um, and it's really interesting that you read all of these bosses of tech companies do not allow their children to watch screens at all in early childhood. Um, and there's been some really interesting articles written out about that, actually. Um, I need to see if I can find and share in some way, actually, about how tech companies are. I read an article of it recently, so I definitely will find it again and put it on my stories, perhaps, about the bosses of tech companies are not letting their children watch screens because they know the long term effects of them. And um, so the contradiction I was going to say is that the, the more we keep our children away from screens in the early years, um, this seems like contradictory or paradoxically, the, the better they're going to be able to handle them in their, in their later years because technology is with us forever and it's going to be a part of their lives. But the early years are the building blocks to what they can do later. Let's give them everything that they need in the early years, which is learning through all five of their senses first-hand experiences, contact with nature in the early years. And then when they're older, when they're at school, when they're um, over the age of 12 and all of their homework, for example, will be done on screens. That's going to be a natural progression, but later, not in the early years, if we can possibly um, avoid it. And yes, in, in the context of concentration, all the good work that we do in other areas will be undone to a certain extent by screen time because um, it's using completely different parts of the brain. And, um, and because of the dopamine that's released, it, they'll need more and more screen time. It'll be harder and harder for them to calm down um, over time. So uh, this wasn't a talk on screen time, but I wanted to just mention it so that um, there's a, a bigger understanding of the, of the impact of it. Uh, if you know what I mean. Um, so unless there's any more questions, I just want to give my few, uh, two roundup points actually, for um, three roundup points for I really wanted to say about fostering concentration. Um, number one, all you need to know about fostering concentration, number one, step back, don't interrupt them. No matter how much you want to tell them that you love them and how great they are and praise them, all those things, just don't interrupt. When you see them focusing or exploring um, or playing or working, um, focusing on something, don't interrupt. Number two, um, step back and allow them to have their experience, particularly in nature. Let them watch first what they're doing. Watch first what they could be learning. Obviously, we don't know exactly what they're learning, but... What could they be doing? See what you can learn from your child. Is that kitten again? See what you can learn from your child, um, from what they're doing, from how they're concentrating, from what they're focusing on, from what they're exploring. See what you can learn first before you try to teach something, before you try to say something to your child. See what, what we can learn as the parent first. Um, and number three, um, time in nature. I can't emphasize it enough first-hand experiences, time in nature, um, that provides such richness um, from feeling the grass to going to the beach to climbing a tree to watching the clouds to hearing the bird song to watching a jumping spider. Um, all of those things provide such a richness that we can't get from any artificial experience, no matter how amazing. So I hope that gives you some feedback on uh, some really solid information on how to foster concentration and develop concentration in your young children. I hope you've enjoyed this evening's session. If you'd like more information on creating an enriching environment, please go to my website, enrichingenvironments.com. Follow me here on Instagram or Facebook, if you're not doing so already. And um, this week, on Friday evening, we commence our autumn series at Yoga House, our autumn film series, because it matters. So we had a summer series, and now we've restarted on the autumn series. These are going to be monthly films, still on the topic of early childhood. This Friday, we are showing a beautiful film from Norway called Childhood, which follows um, the year in the life of a Waldorf, actually a Steiner Waldorf kindergarten in Norway, in this beautiful forest. 
and it um, shows this group of children from three to six year olds, um, mainly focuses on the six year olds actually, um, and sees their contact with nature, sees the skills that they're using, the type of things which they are learning, which are so far away from what we um, expect in traditional education our children to be learning at three, four, five, six years old. So I cannot recommend highly enough coming to this um, film if you are in Dubai or you're anywhere in the UAE. Yoga House and Greens at 7.30 on Friday evening. You can book by going to the link in my bio. Just click on the link in my bio. That will take you directly into the um, sign-up page on Yoga House's website. So that's childhood this Friday and then in October and November we have other films as well on child, early childhood. But I'm looking forward to seeing you all on Friday evening at Yoga House and if not then, then next week on Instagram Live or Top Tip Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you soon. Thank you for the hearts. Bye bye.